and welcome everybody to, uh, I almost wanted to say to our show, uh, it feels a little bit like a show that we're producing here to this, uh, it's, but it's not a, you're gonna get, your, it's an official course, you're gonna get your credits uh, as long as you do the work. Um, but yes, we are here uh, today, I'm here in this beautiful white hill and forest mixed campus of the University of California in Santa Cruz, UCSC together with one of the pioneers of natural language processing and, pi and, and dialogue systems, Professor Marilyn Walker. Uh, Professor Walker has a long history, not only here in academia, she's been, you've been working in uh, many industry, in many companies, right? Hewlett Packard, Mitsubishi, uh, AT&T, labs for a long time, uh, and last year in Google as well, in Mountain View. Right. I uh, went on leave and went to Google. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, we want to know. We want to know a lot. A, a lot about it. Professor Walker is in the computer science and computational media uh, departments, but you also have a master's degree in linguistics. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. When Great. I when I was when I was doing my PhD, Penn had a very strong focus on interdisciplinary work, so they encouraged everybody that was doing PhD in computer science to get a master's in either psychology or linguistics Fantastic. at the same time. Yeah. Fantastic. That's what we are also doing. We're crossing all kind of different disciplines right. here. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about natural language and dialogue systems. That's also the name of your lab. Right. Right. So, well, we all nowadays, we talk with our, I almost want to say we talk with our pockets, with our phones and with our watches, with Siri, and we talk with our kitchens and living rooms with, with Alexa. So we have a rudimentary understanding of, of what these systems are, computational mm -hmm. dialogue systems. From a more technical perspective, um, uh, how would you describe them? What are they? Or what are they? Are there different classes or flavors of them? Where do they come from? What's a little bit the history? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so the very first dialogue systems were being built, you know, like in the early to mid 80s. And the idea was, you know, you had an SQL database and rather than have to write an SQL query to get information out of the database, you would be able to talk to it naturally. And companies, companies were really interested in it. So one of the first things that I did for Hewlett Packard is we worked with um, Unilever to provide a natural language interface to their database of sales and marketing information. And so there was a big, you know, there's kind of a big push then. Um, you know, of having it be a way to make customized reports that you could specify exactly what you wanted and it would go and put the data together. So if you were a sales and marketing manager, you wouldn't have to like master a, you know, detailed knowledge of SQL and be able to write a sophisticated SQL query, You'd just be able to like use your... But back then you wouldn't talk to it, like you would type it or... You mostly type, yeah. It's kind of like a Google search. So Google searches, you type right. something in and something comes but back. You, you know, so my first job was at Hewlett Packard and I was hired as a software engineer, so I wasn't a researcher, you know, at that point. I, I was hired as a software engineer and we did have, um, we had, we had some, we were working with voice input. But it was interesting at that point in time, so the speech recognition was actually too slow. Okay. So speech recognition, I think a lot. Uh, speech recognition wasn't real time, mm -hmm. in the, in the eighties, okay. right? But you could. We we had. Um, so we had typing in, and then we would have text to speech, out along with, um, like along with pictures on the screen. Oh, so text to speech is easier than speech to text. So that came. First. At that point in time, the text to speech, but there, but. Um, there was a specialized box that you had to have to do text to speech. It wasn't it wasn't regular software that would just run on any machine. It was specialized hardware. So some of the things that have changed right now, like why we see this technology kind of coming into the marketplace, is that um, it's a kind of slow transition from voice search. But just having the ability to like talk to your phone to do search on Google allowed the companies to collect enough samples of people speaking that they could get the speech recognition to work much better. And so, oh, so that was a long that was the problem then because people have different dialects. I have an right. I have an accent. People have different accent dialects and right. And so DARPA, um, a government you know government agencies fund, funded a lot of work in this area, and they they had these big speech recognition challenges. 
So they had one, you know, they had ones in 1995, 1996, 97, 98. And those kind of pushed the state of the art forward somewhat enough to support like the voice search. When voice search started, um, you know, maybe only like 2% of the queries to Google or to Bing or one of the search engines, maybe only 2% would have been um, in voice instead of typing. But that too, given the, you know, millions of searches every day, that 2% would be enough to kind of build up, um, build up a big database of, of search. And so voice search got better, and that really helps speech recognition get a lot better. Fascinating. Yeah, we saw that a lot as well. So um, that's actually also how we started in, in this class, talking about big data. So mm -hmm. it was big data, and there's a very tight relationship that we actually see in several, several areas of this, of this computational science paradigm. It's the amount of data that then allows us to do computational, more sophisticated tasks. Right. Because right? you've seen everything. Right, oh, you start to where you've kind of seen everything, and um, and then you also, I mean, the big data goes hand in hand with the compute power, right? Like we have, we can process all that data much more quickly, so we can store it, we can process it, all the so the, all the big advances in like storage and computing um, speed and things like that have really had a big effect. And, and how is it today in, in the industry? Are there different kinds of dialogue system for different purposes? What do you, what do you see in the marketplace? So in the, in the market, I think it's interesting that um, you know, people are trying to build on their strengths, obviously. That's why they're having conversational agents. So I think Amazon's idea, you know, maybe at the beginning was, well, we want people to be able to shop. Right. right. We want people to be able to shop by phone and then they realized that in order to kind of get people to use their Alexa every day, they needed to offer some kinds of um, functionalities that people would be help people do particular tasks like set timers or mm. or listen to music. And the music, I think, is huge. Like when we first started using our Alexa, uh, we found that the idea that you could call up any song from any decade without having to fiddle around with CDs and find the, you know, find the CD and kind of get it on the player and all that kind of stuff. We found it really fun, right? So I think, <laughs> you know, you just have one hook, like the music, and you get people to start using it. So I think, you know, everybody in that space is kind of looking at how many times per day somebody would use the conversational assistant, the smart home device. How many mm -hmm. times per day would somebody use it? Mm -hmm. And they really, you know, they want to get that number up as high as possible, right? So Google, Google has search. So their flagship technology is their search. And, but they've had voice search around for a long time. So okay. they, their challenge is is moving their search capability to, com to conversation. And I think, I don't know if inside Google they still believe this now, but I think when they started, I think they probably thought that, you know, like our search works really well and our speech recognition works really well. So we're like 98% there to mm -hmm. having a conversation. And the thing is, is a conversation is not just a sequence of um, search QAs kind of strung together, right? So there's yes. a lot, still a lot of challenges there. Okay. Um, and so, so that's one kind of system. I think Google, they're trying to treat it as though it's a sequence of, um, of search query. Of individual searches and that, that somehow, you know, you, you build the context from the previous part of the conversation into the next search query. So it's more like an answer and question conversation. And keep going question and answer. So, yeah. you know, like, you know, who is the president of the United States? How tall is he? Who's he married to? You know, does he have any children, right? So each each of those things in sequence would, you know, you take the answer to the first thing and then you, and then when you do the second query, you take the first part of the conversation and you just supplement the query with that. So you make a richer right. query. Right, and you either take historical data or collaborative filtering in order to get, make predictions about what could be the next question. Yes, right. Right, and what is so in, in Amazon, in, in Alexa, you said that would be a little bit different. So in Alexa and Amazon, what they've done is they've kind of taken more of a tools approach, and for each task that they want Alexa to do, they would have built a, what they, is called a call flow. Okay. So they would have, you know, built a, like a, a tree of how they expect the conversation to go with branches at each okay. stage, uh -huh. right? 
And then they would try to, everything that the human says in response to like a question or anything that the human would say, you know, like if you say set a timer, then Alexa might know that she doesn't have the amount of time for the timer, so she could ask the question, or if you say set a timer for 10 minutes, she knows that set, set is a cue, or set a timer is a cue to a particular task that she knows how to do, and each next thing that could happen would have to be anticipated. And what I think is the biggest challenge right now is, and I know people are working on it probably maybe in both companies, but definitely in Google because of the search paradigm mm -hmm. focus that they have, is being able to take those structured call flows that let you do particular tasks and and interleave search with them. So, so the example that um, some of my friends inside Google use would be like the set a timer example where you say set a timer and Google Home or at Google Assistant or Alexa would say for how long and at that point you might say something like how long does it take to boil an egg? Right, because right. you don't know, right? right? And then what would have to happen at that point in the software is it would have to recognize that it's kind of gone outside the flow that it expected and that there's a, a query there that has to go to search, right? Right. Right? And so it would go, so at that point, you know, the query would go out to search. And if you do this search, if you do this on Google, what you'll see is that if you say, if you do, how long does it take to boil an egg? It might come back with the fact that it might just tell you a hard-boiled egg or it might tell you soft-boiled egg, but some of the hits that you get, so it depends on how smart it is, some of the hits that you get on that um, tell you that there's both soft and hard-boiled eggs and it takes three minutes to do a soft-boiled egg and six minutes to do a hard-boiled egg. So it depends on how smart that search thing is and how it gets integrated in the context, but ideally what you would want is that those search results come back and that you could then ask the user a question like, do you want a soft-boiled egg or a hard-boiled egg? Then, right? you have a con then you have a dialogue. Then you have a dialogue. <laughs> yeah, and those, this, those two things are kind of starting to work together. So that the search, instead of just returning a paragraph, like it does, like what you see on the search page, it actually returns the type of information that the structured dialogue is looking for. And that's something that is kind of current currently it doesn't work you can't do it right uh -huh. that's got and that means edge. that's where we need to kind of get to where we can start to do something more interesting and you say so on the one hand we can think about you have this query paradigm and the other one is the call flow that's how yes. you would call it yeah. can you give us some definition that's a more a formal so the query okay again to summarize it's kind of you can think about it the google i'm googling and googling and the call flow can you give us a little uh, a, a summary definition for, for well, how you could put that like in your it, own words? It would go, you know, it would have particular phases of the dialogue. So if you were going to carry, say, I think the easiest example is to kind of move away from the set of timer and consider a task like booking a flight or something oh, right. like that, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Where you have, you have, you know, you know that you need like four or five pieces of information. So that's a kind of classic case for dialogue systems. So, you know, in that case, your tree, it would kind of start out with a greeting, mm -hmm. right? It would know it, and it might have three or four ways of doing a greeting. So it would say, hi, how can I help you? You know, where do you want to go? Or just how can I help you or whatever? And then, and then it would take the user's utterance and it would be looking in that user's utterance for the departure date, the departure city, the departure time, maybe an and, airline preference. And then have clarification questions as well. And then it would really kind of go through to it, it could kind of fill in that whole form. In order to have a dialogue. In order to have a yes. So, a one step answer right. question. Right. And in the worst case, in the worst case, that system would have to have those slots filled in in a particular order. That's kind of older technology. But it's still a lot of that is out there. Like it asks, it says, "What's your departure city? Where are you flying to? What day?" Right, that's when you go to these call centers, and you know, you know already which question will come next. It's kind of like if it reads the PDF document to you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but there's, you know, there's pretty good technology out there for what's called mixed initiative dialogue, um, where the caller could say could produce any combination of. Um, value of the you know the properties that the assistant needs so it could say i want to fly from san jose on tuesday 
Mm -hmm. at 10 right and then you know so that may be like an odd combination of things and then this and then the um system would come back and say where are you flying to right and we try to fill that in because it needs it's kind of like you can think about if you think this uh it's probably a, a toy model but you see think like there's this form behind yeah, it. yeah exactly which, that's a good which... way to think about it there's a form back there and it's trying to fill it in and the question it's with the mixed initiative task oriented systems is does it let you fill that form in in any order in any with any combination with your turn and of course that depends on how well the speech recognition works because if the speech recognition is really limited that's when you get the case where it forces you to do it in a particular order and asks you for one thing at a time but I think the speech recognition is good enough that these that a system that would let you pick any combination of things that you want to talk about, like whatever you thought was most important, you could say that thing first. And it should be, we should be able to now have these mixed initiative systems that, that don't make you go down a particular Mixed initiatives, path. that's what it's called. Mixed initiatives. That's very interesting, yes, because of course, when somebody asks something, it's not we go, somebody might call and say, I want to fly over Christmas uh, to there, but I want to be back before New Year's. Right. And then the system shouldn't ask, when is your return flight? Because I already said that, yes. right? So it right. has to fill out dynamically whatever yeah. I already told it. And that right. has to be, so that's called mixed. Mixed, mixed initiative dialogue. Very and, interesting. Mm -hmm. And when you move, the other thing that what kind of feels natural to me to talk about now is that when you, when you think about these open domain conversational systems, like the Alexa Prize that, you know, might students are working yes, on. Yes, how was that? You, you worked on, uh, on this Alexa Prize. Was and we're that doing it again. This? We just heard last week that we're in the, so this, for this next year, they picked seven teams, a smaller number of teams, and they're giving each team more money. And we've also got into the competition for the second year. So some of, two of the same team members are going to stay on. And then we have three new team members and we're doing it again. How exciting! And what's the ta what's the task? What are you? The what task, is the competition? The competition <laughs> is is that you could carry on a conversation about any topic for twenty minutes. With Alexa. With Alexa, and what's interesting about that task, as compared to like the book of flight task, is that you don't you can't uh, write a call flow for it. That right. is right. So you don't know the document. You don't have a form behind it. You don't have to... a form behind it, and so you have to kind of understand a lot more about how conversation actually works. And what you do need, what I believe you need, and I keep emphasizing to my students, is what you need is a system that can take the initiative. So you need a system. So if you think about like Google search as a paradigm for conversation, that's mm -hmm. all user, that's all user initiative. The assumption is, is that the user has an information need and they keep the dialogue going by, they keep asking questions and the right. system provides the answers. But, but that's not how, imagine like you had a friend who all they could, you know, so they could answer questions, they could set a timer or they could, you know, they could do a few little things like that. Well, they're not a very interesting conversationalist. There are people like this, but it's not, yeah, it's just, you don't want to spend 20 minutes there. You wouldn't want yeah. to spend 20 minutes, right. Yeah. You wouldn't spend 20 minutes talking to him. So I think the, the formulation of the Alexa Prize is good. You know, it's the original Turing test formulation. The formulation is good That's because it yeah. moves, it, it kind of moves people away from thinking about these very, this tools focus or this search focus and to actually think harder about how conversation works. And so to return to the thing about the mixed initiative, the system initiative, I think the system has to have things that it wants to talk about. It has to be able to... It has to come up with something. It has to be interesting conversation it, it. Yeah, it has to come up with topics it, it wants to talk about. It has to say, you know, have you seen, you know, The Crown on Netflix? But it also, has to, it also has to know me a little bit. I mean, it also... I think that's a really right, good point. It has to pick something up because if it, it comes has with... To and start, then it's a, yes. Yeah, it has to start knowing things that you're interested in. So it has to, yeah. you know... I because mean, it doesn't see my face. When I meet somebody new and it's going to, okay, I can, I, can, I can flexibly, you know, switch the topics, but Alexa... Well, they might start... It, and it's kind of scary, actually, now, the see your face thing. So the new, the newest iPhone has a okay. thing where they're doing facial tracking. Oh, why are you okay? And developers have access to the information from that facial tracking. And so if I, you ask a question, I raise an eyebrow, they quickly switch the topic. 
Well, that would be the idea. What the, <laughs> what the claim would be is that in that if they can get enough data, so if people play with these, there's games there and things where they ask people to make faces or look happy or oh, look that's sad. That's how they get the big data. And right. so the thing is, is if everybody plays along with that, that you might in five years, you know, Apple might have a part of their interface where they say, you know, he's happy now, he's sad now, he's puzzled, he's curious, he's, you know, it might and, and pass then they could, And then they could adjust the dialogue to that. And the yes, it's a little bit, ask. I find it a little bit spooky, but <laughs> I, and, but somebody the other night was actually telling me there's some Maybe it's up. They already have a rudimentary version of that. And you can imagine that Watson would already have, maybe already have a rudimentary version like that. IBM Watson in there, in that cognitive... Component. Cognitive computing yeah. component. Yeah. They, you know, they have stuff in there to recognize personality. You know, they might very quickly have stuff in there, or very soon they might have stuff in there to actually recognize some things about somebody's emotion as well. Right, and then with data fusion, I mean, if I have, if I know the personality from what they're saying, and I combine it with the face, I can, I can do data I can get fusion more with that. Fine, right. I can get more fine-grained information. Yeah. So a, coming back to something very interesting, you said the Turing test. So the Turing test, Turing, a uh, founding father of computer science in the 1930s, it was right. Mm -hmm. He he wrote he wrote this paper that basically outlined what we now understand as a computer. So which is also known as a Turing machine, a universal computer. Um, and there's this one, the Turing test, the famous test was if you can speak with something behind a curtain and you don't know if it's a person or if it's a machine and if you couldn't distinguish if it's a person or a machine, this machine would have passed the Turing test because it would, you know, it would be an artificial intelligence that, uh, that gets up to to, to being undistinguishable be, between us and us and the machine. So if you're now in the Alexa Prize and you do a 20, do, would you say we already passed the Turing test? Is that something we already passed? Well, I don't we... think anybody would confuse any of last year's competitors with a human. Oh really? No. Yeah. You could find, how would you find out Like people ask, what are the most difficult things? Sarcasm, irony, I sometimes oh, those, think. Like, we're not, yeah. We just sometimes don't pick up on it. Like right. somebody sarcastic or ironic and yes, yeah, so we so recognizing those kinds of things I think is still very challenging. We've done work on sarcasm recognition. Okay. Um, from social media, so where we have you know thought you know thousands of examples. That's one of the things that we do a lot of time is we collect um, annotations for sarcasm. So if you're trying to do something like that, you know, crowdsourcing. If you're trying to crowdsource, us. Uh, annotations for sarcasm and you're trying to get reliable annotations, what we resorted to was we had nine crowd workers annotate each utterance because there's a lot of disagreement on whether something's sarcastic or not. That is right, right? yes. Right? Yes. So, so we do have a pretty good sarcasm recognizer, but we only use the data where at least six people six, seven, eight, or nine people said that they thought it was sarcastic. That's so something interesting because often we say like, oh, the machine only recognizes three out of six, but if you ask ten different people, also only half out of them, you know, three out of six people might also agree that it's sarcasm. So it's also we don't even agree on it. So we how could we teach how could we teach a machine? And I it's it's a really actually sarcasm is a really interesting case because what I started thinking is that one of the affordances, I don't know if you one of the affordances of sarcasm is that you can be off record. So you can act, you can deliberately be ambiguous, right? So that you can play with your audience where they don't know whether you're being sarcastic or not. Like if I say, oh, this is great, right? <laughs> right now, <laughs> right? right? Yes. You, you know, yeah, you don't the, know what really how like. The machine where, so when you say, okay, so you say the Turing test, no, we are not there yet. No, we're not there. And the team that won last year was the U University of Washington team, which is mm -hmm. um, led by Mari Ostendorf, who's a longtime um, speech person. Mm -hmm. And um, that team won. And some of the things that they did, I think, were really interesting in terms of the system taking the initiative. So they, they took data, for example, from Reddit, from this thread, this subreddit called Change My View. Mm -hmm. where people express opinions and they recycled a lot of those opinion utterances 
as Alexa's utterances. So she would express opinions about various topics, and right. they they took those and and that was one thing that was um, considered kind of interesting and novel about that. Um, one of the things that we did that people really liked, although we're not allowed to do it again this year, is we had games in there. We, had, right. we, had, we had games in there, so there's all this kind of stuff on on Facebook, for example, where you can like do a little quiz, quizzes and games where you can say, am I spicy or sweet? And it asks you a bunch of things and then it says, oh, you're spicy, you know. Okay. And so we had, a, we put a bunch of that stuff in there just to kind of make it more fun. And we actually, on the user evaluations, we got high scores for those conversations where people played these different games that we mm -hmm. had. But this year in the prize, they've said you're not allowed to have any of those kinds of fillers, things that people right. get engaged in that are kind of not really truly conversational. So they're okay. making, they've made the prize harder. Like I said, they've zeroed in on a smaller number of teams. They've made the prize harder. Um, and it's, it's quite challenging to think about. You ha really have to think about, like, if you say something like, I, uh, I watched The Crown on Netflix and I didn't, you know, I'm not really into the royal family, then, you know, for, for me as the system to think, okay, what's a good uh, follow-on from that? What kinds of things can I say there? Mm -hmm. And how would I continue that topic or change the topic or do something else? It's, it's really, really different than thinking of dialogue as being search or thinking of it as being a structured call flow, like set a timer. I would imagine, yeah, I imagine this challenging. I think that's also why they called you. And, well, I will see all of us. We will see in a few years. We will have it in our pocket before we notice <laughs> the results of that. One last question that I had. So you did a lot of work also in storytelling. You already mentioned personality. Now, one of the things that uh, I have in, that that many question, many people have on in, in mind when we go in this in, go to this computational paradigm, computational social science especially, is that traditionally. Uh, basically what you work is with language. So language traditionally, uh, that's usually the domain of the humanities, like literature and English major, mm -hmm. and uh, reading books, that was very qualitative, qualitative, almost closer to art, literature mm -hmm. closer to art than to science, and now you literally, literally, you make a science out of it. I mean, you take this rich and uh, rich literature and you put it in, in scientific, you know, you count it, you put it into numbers in order to be able to teach to teach machines. And you talked about many things like personality. I know you did a lot of, of research on storytelling. Storytelling is something that has been with humankind since we sat around. Yeah, that's around why I'm so empire. interested. Yes. I'm, I'm really interested in the in narrative genre, especially in informal narrative. So, um, so we're I've had a number of different projects in that area. Um, one of the things is the informal genre we've taken, and we used this in our in our Alexa last year in order to like give the system some of its own content. We have these blogs that people posted someplace like Life Journal where they told stories, and we have a lot of those um, stories. We've had them annotated with a deep story structure. Uh, and so we kind of know a bit more about like what the timeline of the story is and what the events. So we have more than just the surface string of the storytelling. And so our Alexa last year, we had a, we had a component where it was like, do you want to hear a story? And then mm -hmm. we would retell some of those stories that we got from social media. So that was one case where, where we've used that. But we've done a lot of work on using that deep representation of story, for example, to be able to change a story that's told in third person to say one that's told in first person that would make like the characters come alive. And um, we're using that now in, a, in a, a system that we're building for National Science Foundation for the cyber learning program where we're trying to improve um, children's oral language and narrative comprehension skills. So we're targeting like five to eight year olds who aren't getting enough language input at home. Mm -hmm. And then the idea would be that there would be a storytelling agent who would say maybe model the child's ethnicity or gender. So it would be an animated character on the screen. And they would interact with the child to tell the story and have the child be able to ask questions about the story. and. That's in collaboration with some folks at UC Davis. 
Um, okay. So Michael Neff in computer science there is a human body animation expert and Emily Solari um, is in School of Education and she works on on uh, reading comprehension, narrative comprehension. So so there's a lot, the, I think this storytelling thing, the storytelling interaction is fascinating and you were talking about like the idea in social sciences, you know, there's there's a lot of things that, you know, like a story at the dinner table, stories told every five minutes or that people use their storytelling as part of forming their identity. Right. Like you decide like what stories you're going to tell and how you're going to tell them and that's part of your self-presentation to your, the world. Your personality is a story yeah. that you tell about right. yourself. Right, the stories that you right. tell about. And also they, people say that about culture. Like a culture yeah. is defined by the stories that it tells. Like what the, what the kind of common threads are in those stories that actually defines defines a culture. So I find, I, I love that area. So, I, you, I could, so I, now, now we, so do you think actually now that we have machines also telling stories with us and you do a science and you understand rather in a scientific way what storytelling is, what makes a great storyteller, what's the personality aspect. So is the humanities uh, with this computational social science since we now have access to qualitative information and can make kind of like quantitative science out of it is that kind of like growing together uh, our people you have a master's in linguistics as well well I Do have they... collaborators in, in linguistics and they're there uh, my collaborators here in linguistics are also interested in narrative structure and I've also talked to various people in literature here so there is a mismatch of methods so so most uh, scientists or whatever you want to you know most people who work in the literature area are used to much more fine-grained analysis of a single story and something that's more qualitative. You're mm -hmm. aware of that. That's kind of what you're referring to. Right. And the idea that a machine could kind of provide them with any insights on something, I think, is still very, it's pretty foreign, I think, to most people in, in literature. But there have been a lot, there has been a lot of work in, in natural language processing recently on just things like uh, looking like take Jane Austen's novels for example and look and build a social network mm -hmm. out of which characters talk to who and how much mm -hmm. they talk to each other and try to understand what the social network is and then there's been some work trying to look at the different ways that a character in a novel might speak when they're speaking to like different people depending on who they're talking to so like you know Elizabeth Bennet when she talks to her sister she might speak or her father or Darcy you know she might speak completely differently in all of those situations and so there's been some kind of like kind of like the work on personality recognition using some okay. of the same kind of tools to characterize like the differences a, you know a character might speak when they're speaking to different people so so then you use the words to classify their personality, which might be complementary. Yes, yeah, so it's complementary. It gives you a right. quick could, overview. It could. And, and, um, and so there could be... But if be, you really look at the text as well with your own eyes or you know the person, you, you might discover some mismatches between what the machine says and what a qualitative assessment Right, and that's of still it. a very new area, that, the area, and I think... You know, it might be one of those areas where you need a kind of a new generation of literary theorists who are kind of open to the idea, you know, that the computer could, you know, provide them with some interesting insights, yes. right? right. Uh, to yeah. kind of move that, right. to move that on. Right? Well, on that note, we, have, we, we hope we have a, a, a big generation, a new generation <laughs> of researchers that will also join. You can find uh, Professor Walker online. As well, okay. all her interesting work and her uh, dozens and dozens of projects uh, that, that she has okay. been and is running in, in her lab and her team. Well, thank you very much. Right. Thank, thank you very you. much for being Thanks. with us. And, it was uh, fun. Yeah. Yes, it was fun. <laughs> that's, not, that's not either sarcastic, not a <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay, thanks.